During the last century, more people died for being associated with Jesus Christ than in all the previous other 19 centuries before it. Good evening, JPC. Do have a, have a seat. Was I the only one then, just before uh, Will started praying, that uh, could hear some bagpipes? Bit of amazing, amazing grace going on took me back. I thought I was, thought I was in Scotland again. We've got a great music team here, haven't we? We I don't think I've ever heard the bagpipes though. Yeah, maybe we could, maybe we could add that in at, uh, at some point. Okay. Anyway, that's an aside. Let me pray for us uh, as we get going. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of music. We thank you that we can come and we can sing. We thank you for your amazing grace. And Father, as we turn now to your word, uh, my prayer is that you would simply. Uh, help us to apply our lives to it. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he, he bids him come and die. I don't know if you've heard those words before. I'm sure some of you ha have. They are the uncompromising words um, of a young German uh, minister by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Bonhoeffer refused to compromise his Christian beliefs in uh, pre-war Germany. As a result, he was imprisoned in uh, 1943, and he was eventually executed under direct orders of Heinrich Himmler uh, in 1945, just just weeks uh, before the Allies liberated the camp in which he was, he was staying. In many ways, it was tragic. But these words, in fact, Bonhoeffer's whole life was based on a sharp understanding of what his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, taught and demonstrated, not least in this passage we're going to look at this evening. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now they're not the sort of words that we would uh, usually slap up on a poster outside the church in inviting uh, people to, to come in. They're not the sort of words you'll find on our, on our website, on our homepage, welcome to JPC, come and, and die. Um, I mean true, I think most of us probably have an idea what, that, what Bonhoeffer was getting at, what the statement means, but we're not quite as keen in making that sort of area a topic of conversation in our evangelism or putting it front and center in, in discussions with our friends and family. We're much more inclined, I think, to talk about the benefits, aren't we? We're much more likely to want to mention rescue and, and, and life and, and freedom because these are, are positive concepts. Now, as, as part of a strategy, and we make tactical calls all the time, don't we, about what we're going to say when and where and what we don't say, but as, but as part of a strategy, that may well be appropriate. But if we're never realistic about the hardships that come with following Jesus, then we need to heed his words in John chapter 16. So let's turn there now, if, you, if you're not already there. We're page uh, 902, right at the bottom of that uh, first column. And in, in the first uh, few verses of this chapter, Jesus, with the intention, really, of keeping his followers from falling away, forewarns them that they will encounter serious hardship for following him. And so let me forewarn uh, you this evening. It is, this is a bit of a tough, a tough passage uh, to deal with. These words of Jesus are, are somber, and we need to weigh them appropriately. And in doing so, I've, 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 I have four headings to help us try and do that. So firstly then, don't be surprised that the world hates you. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. Look at verse 1. Jesus says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. And I think the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is what things? What things has he, has he said 
Well, to do that, we need to just uh, briefly dip back into John uh, 15. This is an example of where our uh, the sort of uh, false divisions of chapter and verse can actually uh, disrupt the flow of what the original uh, Bible writers were trying to convey. So John 16, 1 to 4, is actually the end of a section that begins back in 15 um, and uh, uh, verse 18. And actually both 15 and 16 are part of a longer part of uh, John's gospel that records Jesus' uh, final words to his disciples the night before he's, he's arrested and uh, betrayed and, and, and taken away and, and killed. And so what we have here is part of Jesus' final instructions to his disciples. He's he's already given them a new commandment, that you love one another. He's explained to them his unique role in salvation, that he is the only way, the only truth, and and the only life. He's, He's promised them the gift of a helper when he leaves. That's the Holy Spirit. And then, verse 19 of chapter 15, he says this. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It hates you. Strong word, that, isn't it? Hate. It's not hyperbole. It is the spiritual reality. It is the spiritual reality which so often manifests itself in a physical reality. And Jesus is, is, is saying the world hates us because it hated him. The world will persecute us because it persecuted him. So, JPC, don't be surprised when our association with us literally causes us grief. Operating in a uh, a Nimrod surveillance aircraft at 28,000 feet over uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, one of my previous jobs was to brief uh, the rest of my crew on uh, the surface-to-air missile threat. If we knew that there was a threat, then there were all sorts of preparations we we could do to help counter it, not least (laughs) flying above the actual uh, range of, of the missile. And knowing that things weren't going to be easy, expecting things not to be easy, helps you to be more effective when trouble comes. But if there was no known surface-to-air missile threat, and and, and I'd brief my crew that, and then we were flying, and then all of a sudden, hello, there's there's a missile, what do you think we would have done? Well, we'd have, we'd, have, we'd have taken <laughs> rapid action, we'd have tried to fly high, we'd have got out of there, we'd have got out of there to safety, we'd have abandoned our mission as quickly as we could have done. And so Jesus is saying here, don't be surprised, don't be caught unawares, the world will try and take you out with all sorts of hate-filled surface-to-air missiles, but pay attention to my brief so that it doesn't Um, uh, distract you, it doesn't take you by surprise, and you can carry on with your mission. Which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But you may be thinking, why? Why does the world hate us? Why is it like this? Well, we need to understand that the world and and, and the kingdom of God are mutually exclusive, that they're they're heading in, in, in opposite directions, diametrically opposed. And ultimately, the world is concerned with self in in, in the here and now. It's preoccupied with with, with pleasing itself, with with serving itself, with fulfilling itself, with with promoting itself, and insisting that we all of us do likewise. On the other hand, the kingdom of God is all about serving God, about serving others to God's glory. And the task of a disciple in this kingdom is to go to this self-seeking pleasure oriented world and proclaim truth. The truth that says one day sinners will be judged by a most holy God. The truth that says that in his great mercy that most holy God has provided a means of rescue from such cataclysmic judgment. The call of the world, conform, conform. The call of the kingdom, Stand up, stand out, make a difference for Jesus, proclaim the truth. Can you see why the world hates us? The gospel of Jesus Christ exposes the corruption of the world for what it is. And the world doesn't like it. 
And so it responds with hatred. It, it responds with derision. It responds with hostility towards us. It's always been the case. Just like Noah's contem- contemporaries rejected his message of righteousness. Just like the population of Sodom must have thought that Lot shouldn't be taken seriously. So today, we should not be surprised when the world responds with hatred. And if you think that as a, as a faithful Christian you can be friends with the world and be accommodated by it, then sooner or later you are in for a rude awakening. So don't be surprised that the world hates you. Secondly, Jesus explains more fully the cost of gospel faithfulness. This is verse 2, the cost of gospel faithfulness. And firstly, he says, they will put you out of the synagogues. They will put you out of the synagogues. Now, we know from earlier on in John that by this uh, stage, the Jews had already said that anyone who confessed Jesus as the, as the longed-for promised Messiah, anyone who did that, they'd be chucked out of the synagogue. That's the immediate context for, for Jesus' disciples. And, and by the time that John is writing this gospel, though, we also know that formal parts of the synagogue service had been changed, and they'd been changed to ensure that followers of Jesus were excluded and they couldn't take part. So this hatred was being institutionalized in their place of worship. Does it sound familiar? We're seeing this, aren't we? As contemporary liberalism spreads like the cancer it is within our denomination. And there is a real danger that as that becomes increasingly institutionalized, we too could be put out of our synagogues. We may lose privileges and and property and and status in the world's eyes. People with orthodox gospel views are already being rejected for training and ordination. In Scotland, we have already witnessed faithful churches being kicked out of their meeting places. But you know what? Jesus tells us to expect it. It shouldn't surprise us. He teaches that this is part of the cost of gospel faithfulness, the cost of sticking to the true, the historic, the orthodox faith and practice of the kingdom of God. So make no mistake, friends, such liberalism is part of the world that hates us. Oh, it can demonstrate compassion and inclusivity and and acceptance when confronted with with any one of a plethora of different views, any one except one. The one that says that Christianity is exclusive. It hates that one. The one that says that there are moral absolutes, good and evil, based on, on, on the very character of God. It hates that. The one that says it does, it does matter how we live in light of those moral absolutes. It hates that. The one that says that there is a hell to be avoided and a heaven to be gained. Oh, it hates that. Loyalty to, to Jesus and to his word may mean that we are forced to leave our churches. It may mean that we are kicked out of our denominational structures but if it does we are in good company Jesus is forewarning us about the cost of gospel faithfulness let's go on Jesus ramps it up a notch uh, still in verse 2 when he says indeed the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God I told you this was a somber one this evening and I thought about for this, this for, for a while, and, and yes, it's, it's absolutely true that metaphorically we are called, are we not, daily to take up our cross, to die to self, to, to, to follow Jesus in all sorts of sacrificial ways. That is true. But I'm not convinced that at this part, por- portion of Scripture, this is what is first and foremost on Jesus' mind here. When I joined the the RAF, this was the question I had to think about very seriously. Was I prepared, ultimately, to lay down my life for others in the defense of this nation? I consciously made the decision that I was. But there were times, and there were difficult days, 
when I had to remind myself of that decision. And friends, likewise for us all as Christians, this is not a hypothetical question. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Please, please don't be deceived by by the comfortable Christianity that we have experienced for most of our Western lives. Give thanks to God that through his grace that has been our experience, yes. But any long view of history will prove to you that our current experience is not the norm and it is not what Jesus tells his followers to expect. So you may think of ancient stories of, of, of Christian persecution, believers being burnt at the stake, children being drowned, men and women being maimed, all well documented. But most analysts believe that during the last century, more people died for being associated with Jesus Christ than in all the previous other 19 centuries before it. Put together. This is not a historical issue. Are we prepared to literally lay down our lives for the Lord Jesus. True, in all probability, he may not ask us to. But we still need to anticipate the question. We still need to work out how we're going to answer. We have so much to learn, I think, from our brothers and sisters around the world on this. Let me just take you back less than six weeks. 26th of May to Egypt. 51 Egyptian Christians were ambushed as they traveled to a monastery. Their vehicles were on a road that only led to the monastery. People, they knew where they were going. The men were taken off the buses, their identity cards were checked to see if they were Christians, and then at gunpoint they were told to recite the Islamic Shahada, indicating that they were going to convert to Islam. 29 of those men refused to renounce their Christian faith, and they paid the ultimate cost for their orthodox gospel faithfulness. Jesus says the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to Almighty God. Do you see the the, the deep, the, the sad irony to that statement? He not only tells his disciples to expect to be killed on account of their faith, but the ones who are going to be doing the killing think they are offering service to God. And again, as we look back on 2,000 years of church history, we can see just how true Jesus' words have proved to be. We think of Paul, don't we? Before he was converted, he thought he was offering service to God by imprisoning and then killing Christians. Centuries later, we may think of the Roman Catholic Church instituting the Inquisition, trying to stop those who were preaching the true gospel. We think of the fact that when the reformer Thomas Cramner was being burnt at the stake, a sermon was being preached. And more recently, we we can't help but think of the many examples of Islamic terrorism, where where time and again we're told the final shouts from these suicide bombers, Allah Akbar, God is great, God is greater. All these people think they are offering service to God. And this is the cost. This is the cost for us of gospel faithfulness. It is total. It demands everything. I can't faithfully preach about following Jesus. I can't faithfully teach about how to follow Jesus without explaining that cost in this life. You will be hated. You will be persecuted. You will suffer hardship as a direct result of professing faith in Christ. And if we can get our heads around that, if we can get our heads around that, then when we come to take that stand at work, when we need to do that, when we come to the very real possibility of of losing that promotion or sacrificing the pension or, or even losing the job, when we are faced with the very real and painful relational breakdown within our families, when our friends disown us, when we're kicked out of the students' union or or worse, out of the Christian union, when we suffer ridicule on social media, whenever we don't shrink back from doing the right thing because we are Christians, 
We can do so because we're not surprised. We've counted the cost of gospel faithfulness and we know that an eternity with Jesus is more than worth it. Do we? Do we know that, JPC? Paul, the persecutor, turned persecuted, wrote this to a young, troubled church. He said, we do not lose heart, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what he wrote. I think he had something of Jesus' words in mind when he wrote that. Jesus' next words, though, pinpoint the heart of the problem. Look back now to verse 3. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. And so our third point tonight, the real issue is not knowing God. The real issue is not knowing God. It is an ignorance of who both the Father and the Son are. Jesus says that if you've, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. He says that he and the Father are one, and that ignorance of him is no excuse. Let me try and explain. Sometimes being ignorant of something is an excuse, isn't it? Uh, some of you will know that uh, when God distributed uh, the gift of uh, do-it-yourself, DIY, amongst uh, all men throughout all of time, in his sovereignty, I got far from um, a double portion in that gifting. I can just about put up a shelf, I can rewire a plug, but, but that's about it. My father-in-law, on the other hand, uh, not so, he's a sparky. He's been up over the weekend doing some electrical work for us. One of the things he fixed, fixed for us was a, um, a, a bathroom extractor fan. That stopped working. I thought there was something seriously wrong with this extractor fan. It turns out it was quite simple. It was easily fixed in minutes. But my ignorance of, of what had gone wrong was not something I could be blamed for. I just didn't know. Sometimes, however, being ignorant of something is something we can be blamed for. The law is an obvious example, isn't it? I'm sure you've heard it said before. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So as a driver, it is my responsibility to know the speed limit on whatever section of the road it is that I'm driving on. You know, if a policeman pulls me over for doing 60 miles an hour down Gosforth High Street, um, you know, it'll make no difference whatsoever if I say to him, sorry, officer, I, I didn't know what the speed limit was down here. Make no difference whatsoever. In fact, not only is my ignorance not an excuse, but in that case, my ignorance actually contributes to my guilt because I should know what the speed limit is. And the fact that I don't know what the speed limit is just goes to show how dangerous and careless I am being. Well, the same is true with Almighty God, folks. The same is true with God. Listen to how Don Carson puts it. He says, human beings are supposed to know God. We were made in his image, and enough of his nature and character has been stamped on our conscience that we are eternally without excuse. I ought to know God, not merely some facts about him, and if I do not, my ignorance of him is already a sign of my rebellion against him, of my pursuit of other gods, or of myself. Such ignorance is culpable, he says. Such ignorance is culpable. Now, it may well be that you're here with us tonight and you don't know God. And I take it, if that's the case, you're here with us because there's, there's, you wanna, some, someone's invited you. Maybe you've come off of your own bat. There's, maybe you just want to find a little bit more out about God or Christians or Christianity or church or whatever. But if that is you and you are with us here tonight, can I just say, in the most sincere and loving way possible, that when you stand before God on that judgment day, as we all will, you and you alone will be responsible for how you have responded to him in this life. It won't do on that day to blame your parents. It won't do on, on that day to blame your school or your upbringing or your culture or your environment. It won't do on that day to blame your poverty or your wealth. Whatever your circumstances are, we will all be responsible for how we have responded to God. And you may say, okay, but on the, on the basis of what you've been talking about tonight, John, I'm not sure that being a Christian is really, really all that worth it. Well, yes, I can understand that. And as I said at the start, this passage is a tough one, but it doesn't stand in isolation. 
The whole of John's book is about Jesus, about knowing, about how knowing him means everything. You know, we're just looking at three and a half verses here in isolation at the moment. The whole of, of John's book is about how Jesus has, has made it possible to leave the hatred of the world behind and to be reconciled to our very creator. Jesus said he came to bring life, to have life to the full, both now in this life, whether it's for 50 more minutes tonight, or 50 more years, whatever he ordains, and also in the life to come for eternity. And compared to that, Friendship with the world that hates him is nothing. It's nothing. And so finally, and, and in conclusion, for those who do believe in him, whatever happens, whatever happens, Jesus can be trusted. This is verse 4. But I have said these things, Jesus is saying this, remember, but I have said these things to you, that when, not if, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Friends, the key to enduring persecution, the key to enduring hardship, the key to not renouncing your faith at that point of death is to trust in what the Lord Jesus says. It is to keep that eternal perspective. All of this teaching, as tough as it is to swallow, provides a solid reason to trust him. He knows the future. He can be trusted. Friends, being a faithful witness to Christ in this hostile, hating world, it's not easy. Not easy at all. But if we trust him and allow the truth of these verses to inform our living for him, we too will have that vision of eternity. We will have that stamina. We will have that courage to match men like Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer only lived 39 years. It was a short life, but it was God's will for him. On hearing his sentence of death, his last recorded words that he wished to be passed on to a friend were this. This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. On April the 9th, 1945, in, in a prison yard in Flossenburg, Bonhoeffer was marched naked to the gallows. And he was hung. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that uh, these are difficult words of Jesus. The implication of them may weigh heavy. Father, help us in response to trust you. Thank you that you are completely trustworthy. Father, help us to live with a vision of the glory of eternity and help us to be prepared to take our stand against the world every time you call us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.